This Nevada mule deer hunt is, how do I say it? Just one of those fun things I want to do. Every time I come to Nevada, my friend of 30 years, Scott Jones, who lives in Washoe Valley, just south of Reno, always comes to join me. It's almost as if I find an excuse to come to Nevada. And this year, I didn't have any points. Uh, last year, we drew a really good rifle tag. So when I applied in Nevada, I just put some choices down, thinking I'll be lucky if I draw it all. So I drew a unit that not a lot of people are that excited about. And I told Scott, and he said, well, I'll be there. And uh, sure enough, he shows up here, as he always does, brings his camper and everything, and he came in a couple days ahead of time. Leave it to my buddy Scott Jones to come up with the best camping spot on the mountain. He's an ace when it comes to that. There he is. It's just like old times. It, it's, I, I don't know. I, at my age and as much hunting as I've done, hunting with special people is more important than what the final outcome of the hunt is. When I first met Randy, we didn't do any hunting together. The only thing we hunted for, for was cheap beer. <laughs> you know, we've uh, hunted together dozens of times, and uh, uh, one of the funniest was uh, last year when uh, Matthew had just shot a buck, his son had just shot a buck over here in Nevada, and Randy sat down on a cactus. <laughs> they're poking back out. Look at those, look at how they're poking back out. <laughs> All right, they're going to have to stop. Oh, ouch! Archery mule deer is, in August, is one of the toughest. They're usually in big bachelor groups or bachelor groups of, you know, I mean, I don't think we've seen one smaller than a group of four when they're in a group. To get within archery range is really difficult, especially with uh, any kind of wind changing or anything. You really want to wait till the thermals are right, because wind is what your biggest enemy is. Since you've been here scouting, I'm pretty sure the best thing I could do is whatever Scott Jones tells me to do. Well, until you see the lay of the land, then I know the best thing we can do is what you want to do. So, but for right now, I think if we just get a little elevation, okay. look down over this, there's a, that's where that big long line of taller brush in the dry creek bed is. It seems to be where they're kind of okay. funneling through. Okay, I'll follow you. And he told me, he said, you know, there's a couple nice ones down on this private property, but the ones that I'm seeing up on the public aren't anything to get real excited about. And Scott and I, the night before we started hunting, we were chuckling to each other about how everybody makes a big deal about how big a buck they shoot. And I, don't get me wrong, if there's two bucks standing there, I'm shooting the biggest one. But we, we kind of chuckled about, well, maybe you should shoot a forky on this hunt. Well, I'm not going to shoot a forky. Um, but I got to thinking about that, and in the back of my mind, I'm thinking, I'll shoot one of those two and a half year old bucks, uh, and I'll shoot anything older than that. And to me, I don't really care. Uh, we want to show people that you can come and do this on public land, and any tag is a fun tag. Just go and do it. They're still out here grazing down low. I don't know if they're going to come up to the BLM or not, but. Scott Jones promises me that. He said this is gonna be like taking candy from babies out on the playground. So the very first day we get up on a bunch of these benches and, and it's kind of a, an interesting strategy that we decided upon is down in the very low valley, there's some aquifers that the ranchers are able to tap into and do pivot irrigation systems and grow alfalfa. And it's almost like a big bait pile. All of the deer come there and they feed all night long. And then in the morning at daylight, some of them don't even leave those fields. But a few of them, every one of these little drainages on the BLM that, that roll down in towards the private, some deer will work their way up here. And so the idea was, 
hey, there's already some camps up high where we thought about going. Let's do something completely different. Let's do this kind of ugly, kind of sagey, dusty, dirty kind of place. Doesn't look really like, looks more like jackrabbit country than it does mule deer country. And let's see if we can put a strategy together to shoot one of these bucks. You guys be real quiet. They're, they're just coming right up. Hey, we may have a stock today. This has been a really uh, unique setup where, you know, they're grazing down lower and then they're bedding up near where they're watering. I don't doubt that some of them, you know, water down at the ranch and when they're eating lush alfalfa, they probably don't need to water every day. But what we're finding is that they're uh, coming up this drainage and bedding about where the springs start to, or the water starts to come for the, to the surface from the springs. And we just try to figure out what travel route, what corridors are these deer taking as they're going up into the BLM. And as you drive along or you look at some of this country here, it, it just looks like these big flat dish pans. Well, just about every one of them have a drainage coming down the bottom. And you'd be surprised how deep those drainages are. Sometimes they're five feet, six, seven, even eight feet deep. And sometimes they're 20, 30 feet wide. You just can't see it until you get right to it. And so these bucks are using those cuts. Uh, they're almost out of sight. Sometimes you'll be able to see antlers. Sometimes the whole deer will be up on the edge of the cut, but a lot of times they're just doing the travel through those cuts, coming up here into the BLM land and bedding. At least we know there's some deer around here. It's uh, a classic Nevada situation where there are a lot of deer in the Alpine and a lot of people go hunt them but if you can find a spot like this where there's a pivot you can see this beautiful green pivot it's like a magnet and that pivot is on private but the bedding cover is on the public and that's where the deer are going in the morning if we can see where they bed up here on the public that's that's the answer if we could find where they're bedding then we could put some stocks on them down here in the in the sage. We kind of kept an eye on the bucks and we came up here you know, on these ridges in the BLM and we're glassing and watching. I think there were six or seven bucks in that group and they all bedded in this one spot. And there was this tall four by three that I told this guy, oh man, he'd be fun to shoot. He's about three and a half years old. And so Marcus, the camera guy and I, we decided, all right, we're gonna make a stock on it. Who would think there's eight deer bedded right now? Brush, I think it's gonna look kind of tough once you get in. I know, once I get down there and it flattens out, I'm gonna be like, where, where am I? If there are any deer downwind of me, my worry is they're gonna spook and smell me. I think I'm coming in. going in there and trying to get to where I think this buck is. And there's one little gap where a little two by two can look right at us. And as we get closer, I look and that little two by two is just looking at me through the, the opening in the sagebrush. I'm like, oh no, don't tell me. Well, he stands up and he looks around and I told Marcus, I said, we better start covering some ground here because if he starts giving the signal, every deer here is gonna get up. And he gave the signal, but by then we'd cut the, the, the distance by quite a bit. And every buck stands up and I look off to my right and there's the four by three that I was hoping to shoot. They all see us. That one we were hoping for over there is 70. I'm not taking that shot. These ones over here to my left, there's a couple little four keys. Sage is just too high. 
Well, then I look out in front of me, and this one buck had moved off to the right. But he got curious, and he starts looking at us. And he starts walking back towards us, and I'm ranging him. Okay, 70. He keeps walking. Okay, 60. And now he walks up, kind of down into this bottom and up the other side, and I range it. And just before he came to a stop, I came up with 52 yards. Ready. What's that? I don't think so. No idea what happened. I released the arrow and I see it and I'm like, oh yeah, it's going perfectly. The buck drops a little bit and it goes right over his back. Tell me me, rookie mistake. I know better, but I thought it was a dead deer. <laughs> but he bounds off and he's looking around I'm like, what was that? And uh, he eventually just walks off. I went over there, I found my arrow. <sighs> well, I'd like to tell you that there was blood on it. There's not. Yeah. Sorry, man, that Scott. Was exciting, man. No, that was sweet. We were. He was. Uh, I could hear. He was. Uh, Mike was starting to breathe hard. <laughs> <laughs> In fact, I think he even said, "I'm having a little anxiety." <laughs> oh, dang it! I don't know what happened. I'll have to look at it on film. I might have shot right over him. Hey, I really didn't want it to end right now. <laughs> <laughs> group of 10, they're just right in between us and that guy raking hay, okay. and they're going along the edge. Oh, One yeah. of the bigger ones did come over in the sage. Oh, God, started. there are a couple of dandy. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's quite the raking operation yeah, you've got there. That's like a 30-foot swath. They're completely oblivious to the tractor. Maybe we should go ask that rancher. Hey, can we borrow your tractor for a while? <clears throat> well, five of the 10 of them have broke off and uh, are coming this way. Unfortunately, they're not the bigger ones. There's one okay buck in there. There's four smaller ones and him. But they haven't, they haven't uh, moved on to public yet. And I said, well, heck with it. Maybe we should go back up on those ridges and, and wait for them to see if they'll come up there. Groundhog Day, folks. The deer are doing the same exact thing they did yesterday. So we're going to go hide the truck again like we did yesterday. We're going to climb up this mountain and let the sun bake us to no end. And then we're going to watch these deer eventually bed. And we're gonna go and shoot another arrow right over their back. I like the confidence. You good with that, Dr. Jones? But all but the last part. All but the last <laughs> part? <laughs> you're, wow. gonna, you're gonna shoot him today. You think so? So. I don't know, my hair is just kinda out of place today. an hour later, here they come. I can't remember, I think there were four or five of them. Come strolling by. What do you do? We were gonna hike up the mountain and the deer come in bed over here about 200 yards from the truck. What would the audience do? Shoot a 4x4 buck bed at 200 yards away, or would you go hike these 
And so we repeat the same thing. The idea is that uh, Scott's gonna stay up with Michael. They're gonna film and, and keep an eye on things. And Marcus and I'll drop down into this ditch and we'll try to put a stock on. closer and closer and I take my binoculars and I look and I can see antlers moving and I range it and it's 80 some yards I'm like oh that this could happen and there's this little point in the creek and if we can get right there I'm thinking okay that's probably 40 or 50 yards up there we're gonna be maybe 30 yards 40 yards at the most away from these deer and uh, so we keep going and going and we're sneaking as good as we can and it's getting close now and all of a sudden <laughs> a sage grouse takes off from right underneath my feet flies almost right over the head of these deer and lands on the other side of the ditch and obviously the deer are like hmm what would cause a sage grouse to get scared like that and so the one buck i wanted to shoot stands up and he's looking right at me. Well, obviously he knows the gig's up, he can see us. He bounds down into the creek, comes out the other side with three of his pals. And uh, that was the end of that story. Well, we flushed a sage grouse right here. one in the group, the one we were hoping to shoot. Three and a half year old, four by four. Yeah. All stood right there. Either my rangefinder is stuck on 52 yards or they just come to 52 yards. I'm a big fan of sage grouse, but dang it. That was one sage grouse I really didn't need to have around there. And so we, we're kind of, the, the deer are walking down the creek and we're following along parallel in them because they're slowly getting closer to the creek. And I get ready to jump across the water and there's a snake about this long slithering through the grass. I almost stepped on a snake right here in this pool. I was thinking, it's, yeah, this is a good place to run into rattlesnakes. And in my jolt the jerk, the deer just took off on the dead run. So that morning was gone, and uh, but everything's working. The, the strategy that Scott had kind of laid out in his scouting days and, and told me he thought would work, was working. It was, I mean, two days, two really close stocks. There, there's not much more you could ask. That evening, we go back down to the alfalfa fields and we're just watching where these deer are crossing, what they're doing. And again, they, they walk right past my truck while we're glassing. And I told Marcus, I said, we gotta just hop out, run down to this fence corner and see, maybe they're gonna take this gully that goes down there. And we get to that gully and there was another buck out there that they'd picked up out of this group. He's really a nice, he's bigger than any buck we'd seen. Uh, but he spotted us and they all took off one in the other direction. I'm like, oh, crud. The beauty of that though was on our way there, we found this really deep creek where the, the deer, when they leave the alfalfa field, they disappear for a little while. Well, we found out why. There's the, this slope and area, the area that kind of slopes in, and then there's this cut. And they're coming right up that cut. They're, they're crawling underneath the barbed wire and coming back up to the BLM. So Marcus and I get to thinking, well, tomorrow morning, maybe we ought to go just set up shop right there and catch them coming right off the alfalfa field. 
So that's what we did. And the hope was they'd get right underneath that fence and have about a 20 to 30 yard shot. And uh, we'd been sitting there, I don't know, hour and a half, sun's starting to get up, it's starting to get hot. And all of a sudden we can hear toom, 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 and we look over our shoulder. And here's this tall, I think he's almost a three point, but he's mostly a forky. Across the fence, man, he just put it in high gear and he was gone. There was not going to be a shot opportunity on that one. And not long behind him, here comes a forky, probably a year and a half old buck. And so we're, we're sitting there for probably another two hours and it's getting hot, really hot. And I'm telling Marcus, the camera guy, I'm like, I, I don't know that I can stand this much longer. I'm about ready to melt here. And I think I hear something and it sounds like a deer walking on rocks. Marcus, I said, that thing's dying. That, that buck is not going very far. 
and the buck stood there for the longest time and he's kind of facing quarter and away from me and Marcus is over here and I got up behind it and I thought well I'm just gonna sneak up there and see I'm gonna watch make sure it, it goes down and it wasn't going down so I thought well heck with it I'll put another arrow in there and I'm ranging it I got to I think 40 or 41 yards and just as I come to full draw the buck turns and walks forward so I didn't want to shoot it in the rear end obviously now it goes over to the other bank and over there it's tucked into the brush and I'm getting closer getting closer again I get to about 41 or 42 yards and he's tucked into the brush and I'm looking at him I'm like you know what if he isn't down already I better get another arrow in him so there's just little like V in the brush I mean it's not much and it's the back of his ribs and I shoot And I, to be honest, I still can't tell you what happened. I, I think it hit a piece of brush and deflected straight down based on how the arrow was. It was, it just went straight down in the dirt. That one hit him. Must have hit that brush. And he stops and there's times when he's wobbling and wiggling, and I'm just telling Marcus, well, he, it's a matter of time, he's, he's done. And uh, we just followed him and watched him, followed him and watched him. And finally, he stood there and stiffened his legs for a while and, and shook his head a bit. And he took off kind of toot, 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 like he wasn't even hit. Like, how can that be? So we went back, got to the blood trail, and there's just gobs of blood in a lot of places. But as quick as he got up out of the ditch, in that one spot where he'd wobbled and almost fell, he actually put it in reverse for a minute, and there was a big pool of blood there. And then after that, it was just little strings and drops. I mean, it was easy to follow for quite a way, but then by about a half mile, it was done bleeding. I've been tracking this buck now. We had great blood for the longest time. I'm like, he's going to be dead here any minute. And then now we're on about hour, over past two and a half hours. And this is our last track. And then he got into all this hard pan stuff and a rock. And from back there, I saw him heading this way was the last header I had on him. So we're just gonna, me and the two camera guys are gonna spread out. Scott's gonna go back to the truck, meet us up there where this drainage hits a road. And we're just gonna grid from this point forward. And I don't know, maybe. I guess you shouldn't shoot when you're caught off guard. Either way, I'm done hunting. Whenever I hit an animal, I'm done, so. And we all split up and we're just gritting it, thinking we might find him and Scott bumped him and the deer took off running and Scott was down in the ditch when the deer took off running so I didn't know which direction it really headed. I, and he, he was down in here and uh, I was walking the bottom thinking you know, you know I bet he's going to be bedded in the bottom. Yeah. There was water up there I don't know if there's any water further down but uh, um, I just kept staying to the bottom and I it, it, and he, he popped out right over here. But I mean, he gave, he just looked just momentarily and then boom. I mean, he didn't look sick. And we spent the rest of that day looking for that deer and did not find it. Just, I, I don't know. This is when hunting tests who you are and what you are and what you're about. I told Scott, I said, there's no way I'm hunting 
any other deer besides that deer for the remaining four days. I'm going to find him dead, or I'm going to find him alive and I'm going to kill him, or I'm going to find him alive and maybe the hunt's going to be over before I can get a, another arrow in him. But I just, I didn't sleep much that night. You just, when that happens, it, no matter how perfect you feel it is, uh, you know, when you got to twist a little bit or whatever, you got a fully alert deer, there's, I can make all kinds of excuses. There is no excuse. You give me that shot 10 times, I should make that shot 10 times. And I thought I did. And so the next morning, first thing we did was we said, all right, let's go back to the alfalfa fields, make sure he didn't get down there and feed. And while we're down there looking, some really nice bucks come right through the gap where Marcus and I had set up the, the prior morning, but I'm not, I'm not going after him. It just, it's not how this hunt is gonna happen. I hit a deer and once I hit an animal, the hunt for anything else is over. I'm gonna spend the next four days doing what it takes to kill that deer. And those bigger deer, those really nice ones that came through there, you know what? They're, they're free to go. So we didn't see that buck that morning. And then we decided, all right, let's drive way up here in the BLM, you know, two, three miles away from the alfalfa fields. And let's look and see where that buck might, you know, we. We know where we bumped him the day before the afternoon before. Let's get up on the hills and let's just glass. And we glassed and we glassed and we glassed. And finally, Marcus is like, I see a buck down there. And he's not like any of the other bucks that we saw come off the alfalfa this morning. Maybe it's him. Here's why you bring camera guys along. Marcus claims. I haven't seen it, but I'm going with him. He seemed pretty confident. He's never let me down yet. He claims that he saw our buck right up there about three quarter of a mile. So we're gonna go climb the other hill right above where he saw that buck and inspect it to make sure it's our guy. And then we're gonna go kill him. was acting like a deer. Yeah. And he's eating and he's drinking. And... That's unbelievable. So the buck that I hit yesterday, Marcus was right. He'd seen him and he's walk now another half mile out of here just walking out there completely unfazed crazy and so all of day four was spent that afternoon that evening, glassing that spot where that buck disappeared, and he never showed up. I have no idea where he went to. Maybe he didn't disappear like I thought he did, because they went just over this little rise and never popped up again. Maybe he got down in the creek and he kept going way further up the creek. I, I don't know, but he disappeared and didn't come out that evening. I mean, I've had wounds and uh, couldn't sleep that night and stuff. And but um, and I, you know, nobody feels worse about it than the person that pulled the trigger or you know made the shot. But yeah. we all hope for a really quick kill. But um, 
you know, it's it just sometimes it doesn't happen. You know, you've hunted with me enough to know that I will hunt that same deer until the end. Oh, I know. Yeah, and I, I mean, I totally respect that. And like yesterday, you know, when that nice big four by three was coming by. <laughs> I'm sure a lot of people would have said, oh, I saw that buck yesterday afternoon. He's still alive. He'll be fine. Let me go shoot this bigger one. But for me, once I hit something, I'm hunting it till the end or until I find it dead. Yeah. Or until yeah. I got to go. Yeah. And my hope is that he's just fine. I don't know how he can be just fine with all the blood that he lost there for that while. It wasn't. It was only 10 minutes. If you think about that in time, it was only 10 minutes of bleeding. 15 maybe. Right. I mean, I've cut myself and had it, you know, bleeding that long. And yeah. I'm not trying to downplay the wound. Uh, yeah. It's just, it wasn't lethal. No, I, I, there's no doubt it wasn't lethal. At least not immediately. I just hope it's not lethal right. eventually. And he does some agonizing right. extended death but. <sighs> well when you decide to hunt that's a responsibility you take yeah. and you better man up when it happens Marcus and I came down here to see if by chance that buck came down towards these alfalfa fields last night to eat. We'll see. This is our last day. We can't hunt. We gotta be on the road by now. So we can't hunt this afternoon. But wish us luck. That's him. You got... You think he's coming up this way or is he gonna... I don't know, but... Do we want to get down there? Or... I don't know. Do we just watch him until he beds? Uh, if he starts heading that way, I think we get down there. I think he is. What? I think he is. Yeah, he's motoring. I could tell you guys some BS story. I could edit it out and say it didn't happen. There's all kinds of things you can do with TV, but that's not what we do. It, you know, it looks like a perfect hit. You're, when you saw the shot, you probably thought, whoa, that looked like a good hit. You saw all the blood, you probably said, oh my goodness, that buck's not going anywhere. You saw how sick he looked after the shot. You probably thought, just like I did, that buck's going down. But he didn't. So, the hope is that someone watching it 
says, yeah, I see what happened there. I hope it doesn't happen to me and I'll take extra, every, every extra precaution to make sure it doesn't. And, I mean, we all do. We all take every precaution possible. We try to get as close as possible. But sometimes it just, it doesn't go how you plan. Yeah, I'm sorry. Sorry for the deer. Sorry for, uh, just sorry. <laughs>